Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor, and this is pretty awesome from uh, Ray Fuentes. You know, Glint's one of my sponsors, but Ray Fuentes ordered the Glint card, and he um, shows you in this video how uh, he got it and how it worked. Check this out, family and friends. I received my Glint MasterCard debit card in the- This guy's, this guy's a great marketer, by the way this week now i can buy save and spend gold digitally anywhere mastercard is accepted welcome to glint glint is a movement for gold as everyday money designed to provide reliable form of currency protected from the inflationary practices of governments i activated my debit card at the beach and used gold to buy a cup of coffee with glint gold ownership is digitized democratized enabling anyone to transact gold in real time the gold i own with glint is securely stored in a swiss vault and insured with Lloyds of London. When I make my purchases with my Glint MasterCard, my gold is sold and the transaction is completed with my local currency. Glint is key and gold is security. Check out Glint today. So yes, Glint's my sponsor and the, there's a link to Glint in the top of the description of this video, but there's also, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also a uh, link to uh, link to one of my other sponsors and you can buy Glint Private Equity if you're an accredited investor and that link's up there too. So check it out. Now, this is big, folks. Elon Musk, he's confer converting uh, the uh, t converting Twitter to the X app. I think he's doing it on Monday. And everything I've been reading is that people are going to be able to all of a sudden monetize their Twitter, which will then be called X. And I've always believed that this is going to be the everything app for the United States. Wouldn't surprise me if XRP slash and or XR, XLM is somehow involved in the back end of what he's doing there. Uh, can't prove it, but I have a gut feeling on this thing. He, I, I've always found it interesting that he'll talk about Dogecoin all the time, but he's never, ever, I've never seen him mention XRP or XLM. And we know he's been, that he's been following the Ripple case because we've seen him like tweets and tweet things out around it. Okay, <clears throat> then you've got this. Um, he said, if a good enough X logo is posted tonight, we'll make it live uh, worldwide tomorrow. Well, there is no better X logo than the one that we already have for XRP. Wouldn't that be something if that became his logo? All right, now there is a, we've had a price pullback and there's a tremendous amount of FUD going on. And I wanna make a point about this. When I see all this FUD now, I mean, first of all, we've seen it for years now, but when I see this, you have to understand, XRP, as I sit here, is the only digital asset in the United States with legal clarity. These people are going crazy for a reason. You don't see people take shots at, uh, unless people are, are they take shots at people that are on the top rung you don't see um, you don't see the uh, tenth place guy be having shots taken at him. Life doesn't work that way. They're taking shots because this is this wasn't just a win. This win came out of nowhere and it was it was ten times. Remember, this is this is. I mean, look at the shots they've taken. They took it. Uh, I mean, these people literally tried to take Donald Trump out of office. And this isn't a political show, but I mean. Look at the shots that that guy has taken for the last however many years, five or <laughs> however many years since he won because he shocked all these people. Regardless of what you think of him, the guy shocked the power base in the United States and they have ferociously gone after him. Well, the same thing's happening right here. The good guys won and the bad guys are all over it for a reason. Talking to someone who still doesn't, Stuart Alderati and them, they can't believe that they're being, at all the attacks, I guess, now after they won, after fighting for all this time. Talking to someone who still doesn't understand that the token itself is not a security, it's like explaining to a flat earther that the world is round. 
And then Brad Garlinghouse, an important topic, has come up about protecting retail. The SEC created this mess by proclaiming it was the cop on the crypto beat when it had no legal jurisdiction. Where's that gotten us? Consumers left holding the bag in bankruptcy court while the SEC holds press conferences and while Gary Gensler puts steak videos together, not to, not to be confused with S-T-E-A-K, ha ha ha. And then he says it's absurd to blame a judge for faithfully applying the law. We all know legislation, not more regulation by enforcement, is the only way forward to provide clear rules and protect retail. Glad to see more members of Congress like Representative Ritchie and Patrick McHenry champion this. What I think is bizarre is to have an SEC that is wanting to fight a, a ruling when, <laughs> I mean, you'd think that they would be they would be worried about applying the laws as they're decided. Well, not this SEC. They're a political animal. Now, it is thoroughly enjoyable. You, let's not forget, folks. You cannot forget in this whole saga. It was the Bitcoin and the Ethereum maxis that thought that they had regulatory clarity. They thought that through Hinman's speech, they had given themselves a monopoly that would remain that way. It wasn't until we discovered ETHgate, we've, we've poked holes all in the Bitcoin Ethereum lie. And I do mean it's a lie. The whole thing has been a lie. And so to watch these, now these guys are, they're, they're struggling. They're having a hard time uh, talking about how the decision was good, but they, uh, they're struggling. Watch them. I think it's. And remember, uh, these are two of the, the, the uh, these are the guys from Coin Center. These guys were very close. They were whispering in the ear of the SEC and everybody else in this whole process before the Ripple lawsuit was ever filed. These guys, ooh, they can't stand Ripple. I think it's, and we'll get to this in a, in a little bit, but I think it's unfortunate that the judge here chose the specific labels of institutional purchases. Yeah. and programmatic purchases or institutional sales and programmatic sales to refer to these two categories. She could have picked any label in the world. Yeah. She chose those two labels. And I think that has caused some confusion because people think, well, if I, it's, it's about who you are, what, what your position is in the world. Oh, so, so if I'm an institutional uh, you know, buyer, then I have certain protections from the SEC. But if I'm a mere retail right buyer like a mom and pop then i don't have these protections it sounds like a classic <laughs> inversion of the public policy rationale for securities law which is to protect mom and pop and say that the hedge fund can go do what it wants because it because it's a sophisticated investor yeah. money on its own. what is this sdny judge thinking right yeah. like of course she, she, she understands what the public policy of the securities laws are and no such inversion exists here because it's not about the buyer it's not about being an institutional buyer versus being just a buyer on an exchange through the quote-unquote programmatic sales it's about the intent of the seller and what they put the buyer on notice of by their manner of sale we can't go into the world and know what's in the head of everybody who buys uh corn at the grocery store we can know that sometimes somebody goes in front, stands in front of the grocery store and says, yeah, you could buy corn in there, or you could come over here and look, I've got this corn field. I'll give you a huge discount on the future of all this corn. You're going to pay me up front. Like then it starts to become a securities offering because now I've got all these additional promises about what I'm going to do with my corn field. It's about what that person puts into the mind of the buyer. And so you know, not to yeah, yeah, yeah. judge Torres's choice. It's just her choice of word. We agree yeah. with the holding, but the labels are confusing because it really should have been about manner of sale to institutional buyers. It really should have been about an investment contract, a commodity plus other promises versus manner of sale to the programmatic buyers, which is just selling a commodity with no other warranties to those buyers. <laughs> in fact, not even knowledge of who those buyers might be, in which case we can't say that you're putting those people on notice of your efforts. Um, and he says, the S, uh, John has corrected them. He says, the SEC called the sales institutional sales progr programmatic market sales and other distributions. The judge accordingly used the precise language chosen by the SEC to prosecute the case. Now, folks, check this out. So Wolf of Wall Street says Ripple won for at least the next two years appealing to sit. And he's another Bitcoin maxi, but... Uh, for at least the next two years, appeal and decision likely forever. XRP is not a security. It's like, oh, even though it hates me, to, it pains me to say this. Um, 
and neither are most altcoins by the same rationale. Well, see, this won't prevent Gary from going after the other altcoins. Have fun staying a trader. And then John Deaton here, um, it, this was a, a retweet of the US SEC hinting at an appeal. John Deaton says, an appeal is not even close to being a setback. First, it will take two years from now before a decision is issued by the second court circuit if it's appealed. The Torres decision is law until then, at least at least in Second Circuit. Second, if the Second Circuit and Torres was wrong regarding her application, says they were wrong about her application of the third Howey test factor, which I predict they, predict they won't, that doesn't mean the SEC wins on programmatic sales, sales on the exchanges. All that happens is that Torres then applies the other two factors and could likely still rule the exact same way, concluding the SEC didn't satisfy the common enterprise factor, which is more difficult factor to meet, in my opinion, and, than the third factor. Don't let anyone underestimate how significant this win is for XRP. Oh, it is a mess. I don't think I don't think they're appealing. I think we're getting a post judgment settlement. I, but I but I do think that there's a concerted effort to scare the same banks that now they now want no want to use XRP. I think that that's what a lot of this is about. Now, <clears throat> Charles Gasparino has written has written a uh, an entire write up to try and scare everyone about. Oh, this, he calls it uh, the crazy court ruling. He calls it bizarre or whatever. <clears throat> Let me explain something to you folks. You know, Charles Gasparino was, he he at least covered this case early on, Ethgate and all that, when, when no one else was. But I think it's become pretty clear that Charles Gasparino has been, whatever you want to call it, gotten to by the establishment. He's in New York. He's been there his whole life. Um, how many times have we, how many times, let me ask you this, how many times have did we see Fox Business, Charles Gasparino and crew, I'm not going to throw Eleanor Terrett under the bus because I would bet you that she probably hates what she's watching him do right now. But how many times did we see them say that they had closest source uh, uh, sources close to um, Jay Clayton or sources close to Bill Hinman. Well, from what I've learned, and I don't I don't know it for a fact, but from what I've learned, when you hear sources close to, that means they're talking directly to the person. So if they're talking directly to the person, why have they why have none of these people ever been willing to come on the record live? Brad Garlinghouse has, John Deaton has. How come Bill Hinman and Jay Clayton have never been willing to talk live on TV and be, been asked real questions by real people live? I believe it's because there, there's questions they cannot answer. And so what is your second favorite way to get your message out if you're Jay Clayton or Bill Hinman? Well, it's to hide behind the scenes and whisper in people's ear. And that's what I believe is going on with Charles Gasparino. I can't prove it. But that's what I think is going on. I don't know what his motivations are, but it's pretty obvious what's going on. But let me tell you this, and I reiterate this. XRP, the only digital asset in the United States with legal clarity, and they can't stand it. The reactions show just how massive the win was. That's what this is all about, folks. This thing, this win was even bigger than you and I think it was. And that's why they're going crazy. And that's why Charles Gasparino's out there. I don't know who is sending him out to act like this, but it's like unhinged. Now, check this out, because no matter what they do, no matter what they say, here's what's coming. So, but the U.S. The Make no mistake, bank announcements are coming and get ready. If Look, and think about this for a minute. The more people there that they can potentially scare, the more banks that they can potentially scare from doing business using XRP, that's, uh, if you think about it, when this thing's appealed, or if it was appealed, I don't think it's going to be, <clears throat> if it's appealed, the judge has more, the appeals court would have more and more pressure on them if there was two years worth of XRP adoption in the United States as a result of the ruling 
it would be a much tougher thing to get an appeals court to overturn it at that point when Ripple's attorneys are in there saying, we've got banks using this because of this ruling now. Imagine that. And that's a factor, too. That's part of the reason that these guys are out here going crazy. So, but the U.S., that what, what is the situation in the U.S.? Is, is that lack of clarity and the concern about the asset class, has it changed the way banks are looking at investing in this space? Or what, how are their plans uh, in the face of this ambiguity and basically the, con- the increasing regulatory concern? You've seen some, public, some, some, some bank CEOs, some large bank CEOs very publicly say, we still believe the technology is really going to provide meaningful benefits. I mean, there, there, there's been a debate. Uh, there's been some papers and things debating what's truly the utility. Right. And I think you would probably agree with this, is that digital assets and distributed ledger technology are really good at things. They're not, it's not everything. There are other technologies that if you look at an end-to-end process that you would deploy, but there are real benefits in, in reducing um, and trusting information, so reducing the number of people that have to validate information you know, digitizing assets that don't have a lot of liquidity. There's a lot of, you know, real utility. And I think you've seen some people in large banks say, yeah, here's the use cases, here's the benefits, here's why we still believe in it. So I think for those institutions, regardless of it's not necessarily maybe the best regulatory climate, um, maybe they view it as an opportunity as well, because they can actually catch up to maybe non-banks were a little bit ahead of them in development, but maybe a trusted pair of hands is what's needed also. Maybe that was the whole purpose of the Ripple lawsuit was to stall them. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family the banks are coming and the Charles Gasparinos are trying their best to scare you off from that fact. Thanks for listening.